Hey, Retro Battle Stations, it's uh, Directive Zero here. I see it's Sinclair Month. Usually I wouldn't really have anything to offer. I live in Canada, so we never got Sinclair stuff up here. I don't think I ever saw one when I was a kid. I didn't even really know about Sinclair as a company until I saw the awesome docudrama Micromen, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Clive Sinclair, the man who brought you Jet Set fucking Willy. Anyways, after watching it, I realized that I had really fallen in love with the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. So I started looking online, tried to find one on eBay. In some cases, there was no guarantee they were even working, so I wasn't going to do that. Luckily, I have a friend who lives in England, and he knew what a nut I was about personal computers from the 80s. Managed to find one for me on Craigslist for like something ridiculous, like five pounds. It was cheap, really cheap. It came with all sorts of stuff. I got all these data sets. I took it up north to try it out, and I, I started filming this sort of jokey review about it, but I never actually finished it. So I have some footage to show you, but it's all kind of old, and some of it's kind of silly. Right off the bat, the first thing that surprised me about the Spectrum was just how small it is. It's really tiny. I mean, here it is next to my Commodore 64, which is already, for its time, you know, a pretty small computer. It's got, of course, the infamous squishy keyboard, which, as I expected, was absolutely terrible to type with. You know, it kind of feels like a speak and spell. It's like a toy. You can really tell Sinclair spent a lot of time trying to cut corners and reduce costs to get this down to their price point that they wanted. I popped it open and it was really easy to get into. N nothing like modern computers with torque screws and tamper-proof screws and all that garbage. If we look around the board we can see all sorts of ways that Sinclair, you know, cut corners. This 7805 voltage regulator and this giant aluminum heat sink which I just think is great. And underneath that, we can see the ROM and the CPU. The CPU in this case is a Zilog Z80, but this one's made by NEC as a second source. The RAM was really interesting, I thought, because you have this bank over here, which is, you know, no big surprise. And then you have this bank, which is a whole bunch of defective RAM chips that Sinclair used. Instead of using, you know, top tier chips, they just got defective chips. Only half of the memory was defective. So they were able to use broken chips essentially instead of buying all new chips which is again just lovely just wonderful how they managed to cut corners on this thing another interesting part of this in many 80s computers is the rf modulator here so the rf modulator takes the composite video signal produced by the board and then embeds that in a high frequency radio carrier and then you plug that right into the antenna portion of your TV, the TV just thinks it's a radio signal that it's getting, so it displays it like it would any piece of broadcast television. But I don't have any monitors that use antenna connections, so what I did was I disconnected the 5 volt power from the RF modulator, and then I disconnected the RF modulator from the RCA jack in the back, and connected between the composite video signal and the RCA jack a filtering capacitor to try and clean up some of the video. Once I had modified the RF modulator, I started looking around the board again and I noticed this 40 pin chip, the Ferranti ULA on it. And I was really, you know, unfamiliar with that. I had no idea what this chip was. And as I started researching it, I found it more and more interesting and eventually ended up buying this book, the ZX Spectrum ULA, How to Design a Microcomputer, which is a really fascinating read. It's got a whole bunch of really cool illustrations and. But basically what it comes down to is the ULA is a lot like field programmable gate array today in that it's a way for companies to produce their own IC without spending a lot of money. So how it works is if we go right down to the silicon chip at the center, you can see that at the base layer, the master slice of the chip is a whole bunch of little cells and within each cell is the same arrangement of transistors, some current sources, 
and some resistors. And the way you arrange them defines how the chip will perform its function. So all you have to do is apply that top layer and it's your custom chip. So Sinclair doesn't have to design and then produce a custom chip, which is really expensive and requires you to do them in large numbers for it to be worth it. I think it's fantastic. I really recommend reading about it. It's an interesting piece of electronics history. And Ferranti is a company that's a giant in computing history, and they were integral in the creation of things like radar during the Second World War. And then after that, they produced some of the first business computers and eventually went on into the component industry. They're a shadow of their former self. This big computer here is the Ferranti Pegasus that's on display at the Science Museum in London. I really recommend you go and see it. It's a beautiful piece of heavy metal. I have the Sinclair ZX Spectrum all modified now and ready to go. I need to power it because it came with this UK power adapter I can't use here in Canada. So I have a 9 volt AC-DC adapter, but it's not center negative, which is something you need to be aware of. You have to make sure your barrel plug is the right polarity for this or you could damage it. I got these things from Adafruit though, they're little barrel plug male and female connectors with screw terminals on the back, so all I had to do is reverse the polarity of my AC-DC adapter and it booted right up, no problem. I was ready to try some software. I said my friend gave me these data cassettes, but I am not messing with those. I took the mono audio cables that I had been supplied, and I found this app for my phone. I was able to load up a, uh, a tape backup from one of the many websites online. There's tons of software out there. And yeah, loaded up just fine. Here it is. My gold standard for every personal computer I try is 3D software, and this is View 3D. It's a really basic extrusion-based 3D modeling program. It's pretty cool though. I, I had a little fun. Check it out. So to me, the really cool part about 80s microcomputing isn't games. It's, it's not even the software that you can find that other people wrote. It's that part of the philosophy of the microcomputer at that time was that you could turn it on and get started programming right away. And most of them came with basic built into ROM and the ZX Spectrum's no exception. So I wanted to show off my basic chops for this video and I dug the ZX Spectrum back out of somewhere, a box, because we just moved recently and I was all set up. I had the camera all framed up and I was gonna write my name and wouldn't you know it, the membrane keyboard's broken. Ugh, I hear it's a pretty common breakdown, but it was working before, so I, I figured it would work again, but there you go, Murphy's Law. So I'm probably gonna have to replace the membrane keyboard in this, which is not something I'm looking forward to, but I hear it's a pretty common problem. I'll find someone somewhere. Anyways, that means I can't really show off any basic in this video, which is what I really wanted to do and what I'm really interested in because, you know, I'm not a programmer, but when you go back to these old computers, it's, it's pretty trivial to get back into programming and, and learn some basics. <laughs> I really just wanted to share my ZX Spectrum because now that I have it, I'm not sure what to do with it and it's always good to get an excuse to bust it out and dust it off and get playing around with it. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to the Retro Battle Station subreddit and if you haven't checked it out, I really recommend you do so. But otherwise, thanks for watching. So long.